my character mm. because my character has been built on growing up as a little boy. I'm just sort of going to be carry on as I am. We felt that Lisa Lee's story raised many questions. How did her biological sex interact with the social construction of her gender as she was growing up? What happened to her understanding of her gender identity when she finally discovered the correct biological facts? How does she experience herself nowadays? So we asked Lisa Lee for a further interview, to which she generously agreed, and I went to South Wales to talk to her. The purpose of listening to Lisa Lee's story is to provide a case example that the authors of the chapter can use to apply our perspectives on sex and gender, and I'll be talking to two of my fellow authors later on. I started by asking Lisa Lee to tell me about a typical day from her childhood. I had a very difficult childhood I did, mm. because I was lots of, um, I used to get bullied a lot. But I was very shy and quiet, you see, so I never really, um, I was never a mixer, I was always an owner. I used to like my own company. And um, my mother had a drink problem. Yeah. So I'd get up and sort of, um, she'd probably be drunk. So there was a lot of violence around as well. So then I'd like to be away from the house. Yeah. Because there'd be lots of problems within the house. So then, um... I'd go to school and I'd have the exact same problems then because I used to get bodies a lot. So I used to um, walk the streets a lot. Yeah. It's just my typical life. But also, when I was 10, my auntie died. So there was a baby in the family then. So I used to, I was off school a lot from the age of 10 upwards, looking after a four month old baby. Oh, wow. So I had a lot of responsibility. It was the choice to look after the baby or go to school. So my option was to look after a baby. Because I never mixed with boys for some reason. Right. I never sort of, um, I was never the sporty type, you see, I was never no. into kicking footballs or anything like that. And you also said in one of the newspaper articles that you, you wouldn't go to the urinals, you would hold on all day. I got a very strong lad, that's just the fact I didn't like going to public toilets, it's yeah. sort of, I don't know, it's like a sort of, it's not for beer stuff, it's just something I don't like going to public toilets, because they're not clean most of the time, are they? Mm. And that was in secondary school, that was anyway, and it was, right. um, that one very nice school, that one. That was an old boys' school, that was. Can you tell me about the first time that you told anybody what you discovered about your biological sex? Actually, that's a funny story, that is. Oh, so I didn't tell anybody. <laughs> first of all, what I did, because first of all, I was misdiagnosed, I was told I had a rare hermaphrodite condition. Oh, no. And they said I'd be dead by the time I was 25 and it'd be a very painful death. Oh, no. And I put on lots of, sort of hormones and steroids to try and stop myself from becoming female. So I thought, well, you can't. If I've lived male all this time, why should I want to change it? I found out later on that you couldn't anyway, it's just accepting yourself. But um, that just made me put on lots and lots of weight, which I'm having difficulty trying to lose now. Mm -hmm. I've lost a stone so far, so I'm slowly getting there. Yeah. But um, the very, very first person I spoke to about the condition, which wasn't quite accurate there myself because I didn't know it was definitely CAH, was a newspaper. <laughs> Once I did the interview, the paper came out and I gave the papers to my parents to yeah, read that. Right. That was my way of sort of getting back as well right. as such. My father did what he usually does, just says nothing and just sort of carries on. And my mother drank. It was just an excuse for it. She always needs a little excuse, doesn't she, to have a little drink. So that was her excuse. And then they just basically don't mention it really nowadays. I didn't really care, to be honest, because I thought, well, I've gone through all this on my own. Her opinion doesn't mean nothing. Although it doesn't sound very nice, but then... I say that about your mother, but then if you've not had the sort of motherly bond relationship. Can you tell me about the first time, or at least an early time, around 14, 15, when you began to doubt it for the first time that you were a boy? Um, well, that's just, I didn't, I never sort of completely doubted it, because I still sort of say today that um, I don't class myself as one or the other quite often, mm. which people find quite strange. But I tell you, I've never felt particularly masculine or particularly feminine. Really, it's more from the doctors. Yeah. Because I was very, very depressed, basically, as a child. I did sort of suffer from depressions. Yeah. And um, when the doctor said this is the type of... I had a rare type of hermaphrodite, I sort of understood it, and I didn't understand it. But I understood the part that they said, you're going to die. And I didn't need to worry about the condition or who yeah. I was, because an end was near, yeah. which I looked forward to. Yeah. Well, tell me, if that was such a relief, then, tell me about when you discovered that you weren't going to die after all. I was probably 1920. And it still took a little while to sink in as well. Sort of, I didn't completely accept it because I'd been told so many other things as well. Right. So I just sort of, oh, something else, never mind, carry on with work. And uh, to be told you wasn't going to die, I found that harder than to be told I was going to. Yeah. Because I was that depressed before that I wanted to die. Yeah. So then to be told that you're not, 
is more of a shock. Tell me about what made sense and how, what, what experience did it mesh in with you which said, okay, now I understand. Yeah, because I was very sort of um, a fair meta as a boy. That's why I used to get picked on as well. Mm. So people used to sort of go for you for certain things, like you'd be a little like, too girly or things like that, and I sort of never understood why. So I thought, well, I haven't actually done anything to sort of make myself mm. appear to be that way. It was just something people picked up. Mm. about the way I was. It was just the sort of feminine side to me, I suppose. And um, that made sense then. I always thought, well, I must try and stop this. Yes. But then I thought later on, I was only trying to stop it, not for myself, but for people around me. I couldn't have coped with everybody else knowing at that time. Yeah. So I thought it would have been much easier for me to sort of stay as I am, as I was brought up, yes. because it would have been easier for everybody else. Yeah, I felt like just to be myself. I didn't feel that, um, cause like I didn't have a very deep voice or things like that. And um, one of your sisters you have been quite close to, haven't you? And do, do you feel treated by her as a woman rather than a man, or a man no, rather than a woman? Really. Does it come to that? Because no, because I've not changed myself. I've not gone around and said, right, this is who I am now. You have to treat me this way. Although I might do it in a year or two, just as I teach a more lesson. But what what name does she call you by? It's Lee. Does everybody in your family still call you Lee? Yeah. Right. But I feel more comfortable with that as well. Yeah. Because I don't want to... Because I've discovered who I am, if you want to say it that way, I don't want to sort of change who I am or make people sort of... to fit in. Yeah. I've always sort of been very sort of the opposite to whatever people want me to be. Like, if you want me to turn up very smart, I'll deliberately do the opposite. What about the way you treat yourself, then? Can you think of a time when you've treated yourself as a woman? Maybe a special occasion, maybe just, I'm going to try this out. Um, no, not really. What so people might say, oh, put on makeup, but if you do a film, you've got to do that anyway. Or if you do right. certain things, you do that naturally, so it's part of work. But I never, maybe, because I haven't lost all the weight I gained, first of all, so I don't feel particularly great. I know I sort of, I look rough. I think I, I might do that on purpose without realising I do a sort of, very sort of stubborn, you see I'm not going to change just because people want me to change. Because now people expect me to go and do the opposite now, be different. Do they want you to change? I think certain people do, or they expect me to. And I sort of say certain things in front of you. So then I sort of... Give me an example. Oh, well, people tend to now talk about transsexuals a lot in front of me. And it's as frustrating that is. Mm. Somebody don't, the show is they, they're that. ignorant, yeah. they don't listen. Because it's not all about choice, that's the whole thing I've told people. It's sort of, um, I haven't chosen to be who I am. This is who I am and I've getting yeah. on with it. Well, there's one other thing that you said in one of those articles, that at 20 you started to live as a woman. Well, that's what um, the mirror said, wasn't it? I got annoyed by that one, actually, and I did. Because this is going to seem the opposite of what I'm saying as well, because I said I've not changed, I've not yeah. become a different person. Yeah. I think the, it must have been the mirror. They put that in, because they thought it was sort of fitted in a bit better. And um, that was one of the ones I didn't like so much, mm. because I said, um, I'm not somebody different, I'm still who I am. Tell me about who you are then in 10 years' time in this ideal, you know, if everything goes well. Who you are, how you look, and what your relationships are like. Well, it's funny you should ask that because I'm one of these people that plans everything. Okay. I've got like two years to do this, three years to do that. I sort of am very sort of boring. I've got my life all sort of mapped out, organised. I still have my career, but I want to be able to sort of, um, I know I'm very dominant in my career, I'm very, I'm in control. I'm a sort of a control freak, I have to know what's going on. Mm. And I think that's my worst fear in life, is sort of not being in control. But I do have plans, sort of, um... Someone asked me once, could I have children? And I said, yes. And I said, would I? And I said, well, I do want one. And I want a little boy. Mm -hmm. Strange that is. But it's because I want to sort of give that person, that child, everything that I didn't have. <laughs> Consider Lisa Lee's story. I have with me two other authors of Chapter Three, 